Okay, good morning, everyone. Good to be here and share with you from God's precious word. I'd like us to turn to the Acts of the Apostles. I know it's been a long time since we were in Acts. I think it was June when we last looked at Acts together, uh, but uh, hopefully we can pick up the threads. Acts uh, 15, I want to read from verse 19 to the end of the chapter, down to verse 41. Acts 15, verse 19, down to the end of the chapter. And I want us to be considering the subject this morning of spiritual leadership. What does spiritual leadership look like? And so beginning in verse 19, it says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them that after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Forasmuch as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your soul, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare ye well. So then they were dismissed, and they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. After they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed on to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. And God always blesses the reading of his precious word. What I want to just say, very, I'm going to give you the cliff notes right at the beginning, but the marks of good leadership includes good decision making. Okay. And of course, when we talk about decision making, there, there's been a crisis in the church, especially about what do you do with all these Gentiles that are getting saved? And there are some that are saying and uh, advocating that they have to basically be circumcised and keep the law in order to be saved. 
And so good leadership makes decisions. And of course, if, how do they make these decisions? By discerning the will of the Lord on the matter. And how did they discern that? Well, they, they used scripture. They were depending on the Holy Spirit. He confirmed their decisions. And then they examined the evidence. And so it was kind of bringing everything together. They made these decisions. But then the second aspect of good leadership, and we'll look at the details. I'm just kind of giving you the cliff notes to begin with. Having made the decision, they were able to communicate the decision clearly. So the marks of good leadership is good decision making and good communication. Because when there isn't good communication, there's a lot of confusion. People are wondering, what, what do we do about this issue? How do People need to know what they're supposed to be doing. And so good leadership communicates clearly and then of course the end of the chapter you see that even the best of men are men at best barnabas and saul who have been our heroes pretty much through this uh this book so far they actually fall out and they disappoint us <laughs> because ultimately the big thing about leadership is there's only one perfect man that ever walked the earth. And we got to, whatever happens with leadership, we cannot take our eyes off him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, because you see, if we look to men and we put men on a pedestal, we're setting ourselves up to be really disappointed. So that's kind of the cliff note. You can go home now if you want to. I'm going to just fill in the details. But that's basically what this passage is about, and I want to just say something about uh, this kind of idea of leadership, decision making, all the rest of it. Uh, I, I heard this statement, and I, it really resonated with me. It goes like this: Truth with transparency equals trust. Truth with transparency equals trust, and I think that's true. Now, a lot of people today do not trust our government. Because it's been evident they're not being transparent about everything. Now, again, I'm, this is not an anti-government tirade. I'm just saying I want to trust the government. But if they want to earn my trust, they must tell the truth. They've been caught in a number of lies at times, right? And they must be transparent. And I think there's things going on that are not so transparent. And so, therefore, it eliminates the possibility of trust, even when you want to trust them. You get the idea? Well, that's the same in any kind of leadership. Truth plus transparency equals trust. And we want to be able to trust our leaders. So, so that's kind of uh, very important to begin with. So, so notice we, we said that the issue that they were dealing with was a very critical issue. Many Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ. And there was a segment in the Jerusalem church they're going to play a real role in the book of Acts and not a good role. They're the, the circumcision party. They're the Judaizers. And what they want is that all these Gentiles, they want to put them under the yoke of bondage of the Mosaic law. They want them to be circumcised. They want them to keep the law. And, and so Paul and Barnabas were advocating, no, 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 this is adding to the gospel. The gospel is faith alone in Christ alone, plus nothing. And to add something to the gospel actually perverts the gospel and makes it no gospel. Because it's adding a dimension that wasn't supposed to be there at all. And so they've discussed this. And in the process of discussing it, they've considered what the scriptures said. You remember, they, they went back and looked at the book of Amos. Uh, they considered what had happened when Peter took the gospel to the Gentiles and how they simply believed when Peter was preaching. And, and so they, they kind of go through all of these things. And then they also have the assurance that the Holy Spirit is leading them to a consensus as they discuss these things. By the way, that, that's always good, isn't it? When you have plurality and they're able to come to a consensus through through discussion and by the way, uh, that's that's discussion that's pleasant. It wasn't accusations at all. This it was very nicely done. And isn't it wonderful when you can come to a consensus as leadership in a plurality and and, and know without without a doubt that the Spirit of God has somehow brought your minds together as one. 
And so they could say, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. That's a beautiful thing. So <clears throat> the decision in verse 19, wherefore my sentence is. And of course, uh, James is acting as the spokesman for the group. And he's basically telling us this is the decision that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. By the way, aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit guided them to that decision? Wouldn't it be an added burden if you, like most of us are Gentiles, if we had to now, you know, kind of go through the whole of the rituals of the law to be accepted before God? Oh, I'm so thankful we don't have to do that. And so it says that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But we write to them that they abstain. And then he mentions four things that they were to abstain from. And again, I want to just say this. It's not a salvation issue. It's not saying they have to abstain from these four things if they want to be saved. No, this is a stumbling block issue. He doesn't want the Gentile converts to be a stumbling block to Jews coming to Christ. So if there's Jews in the neighborhood... Uh, you know, you, you don't want to offend them so that you make it impossible for them to come to Christ. And so that's just don't be. And that principle applies much wider than that, isn't it? Am I being a stumbling block hindering people coming to Christ? Right. I may have great liberty, but am I using my liberty in an, as an occasion to the flesh and causing people to stumble? And so that's the idea. We don't want to be a stumbling block. It's not a salvation issue. So what are these four things? Well, we better look at them. Uh, of course, uh, he says, we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols. And of course, it would be things like meat offered to idols. That was a big issue in the early church. Meat was expensive, just like it's becoming here in these days. And if you wanted to get cheap meat, uh, you could go to the, to, the, to the market and you could buy certain meat that, well, it had been offered to idols. And of course, idols don't have any appetite. And so it's not being eaten or anything like that. But, you know, it's already been used in the sense that it's been waved before this idol. And so you could get a really good discount in the market on this slightly used meat. And so, of course, a lot of people who were poorer, <laughs> they said, I'm in. I'm gonna, that's the best place to get your meat. And of course, that would cause Jewish people to really stumble. And so you've got to think about that. And he goes into that in his epistles, the Apostle Paul does. And then, of course, sexual immorality. Uh, of course, the Gentile world, along with their idolatry, uh, went sexual immorality. And so the children of God, he says, stay away from those things that mark out the pagan culture. That would be a stumbling block. It would be an offense. Don't do that. And, of course, it's not good for you either. It's not good for your, your spiritual well-being to be up to your eyes in sexual immorality so stay away from that too and then he talks about another going back to eating habits again things strangled you see when a jew offered uh, a, a sacrifice they would they wouldn't strangle them they would cut their throats so the blood could drain out and so if it's a thing strangled it's not the blood hasn't drained out properly and that's how the so don't don't uh, do that and then of course eating blood and and again if you wonder Again, why James mentioned these things, verse 21 tells us uh, the word for is a connecting word, right? So don't eat these things for, here's the reason why, Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now, at this time in the church, there's, there's a lot of Jewish believers and now there's a lot of Gentile believers, and they're hopeful there'll be a lot more Jewish believers. They want their people to be reached. And they realize if Christianity has come to the Gentiles and caused them to do these things that would be such an offense to Jews, it might just turn them off. So he said, be mindful. By the way, you have to be constantly mindful that you're being watched by others. And we don't want to do anything that will cause somebody to be turned off the gospel. And so just as a general principle, that's what we need to think about. Now, again, we just we bring that home to our hearts. Lord, help me not to be in any way somebody that would turn someone away from, from Christ because of my freedoms even 
my liberty, but not to use it, that it would cause others. And so the idea is this, that um, in a certain sense, I am my brother's keeper and I have to be very careful about my conduct before others. I I'm an ambassador for Christ, an ambassador for the heavenly country, and I don't want to give a wrong impression of the heavenly country so he says don't do these things and then it says then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church now notice that it's a unified decision so obviously in the jerusalem assembly the decision obviously was made by the apostles and the elders it communicated to the whole church and they're all in agreement there's unity here but isn't it good how good how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity they're on the same page and so it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And so, of course, remember, in the Jewish mindset, everything has to be confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So we're sending two witnesses as well as Paul and Barnabas, and they're not just any old guys. These are chief men among the brethren, well-respected. So, so they're going to affirm the decision that has been made. So there's absolutely no question mark about this. This is not just Barnabas and Saul's take on things, all right? No, we have other brethren, independent of them, who are well-respected, who are affirming these decisions. And so then he goes on and he says, and they wrote letters by them after this manner. And so the decision is put in writing. So again, there can be no doubt. It's, there's a clarity here about everything they're doing. It says this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting to the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria in Cilicia. Now, even that little statement shows their full acceptance of the Gentiles without circumcision, right? Because the, the very first statement, he says, the brethren, the very fact he's calling them brethren, right? This is a Jewish church, and they're writing to the those uh, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia and calling them brethren, right? The, the truth of the one body, Jew and Gentile in one body. And so these are brethren, I was uh, up in British Columbia and uh, I was taken out to an Indian restaurant by an Indian brother. And uh, it was really interesting. The waitress was kind of surprised to see this, this white guy with an Indian guy eating a meal together. And so she asked him in, in Hindi, uh, is that your boss? And so he told me, he said, she asked him, am I her boss, his, his boss? And I said, no, tell her I'm his brother. <laughs> and you should have seen the look on her face <laughs> but isn't that beautiful yeah i'm his brother there's there's no distinctions anymore between jew and gentile slave or free th that unity we have in the body even racial distinctions are gone and it's a wonderful thing and so he says, for as much as we have heard, verse 24, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls and saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. Is that clear? These people, they came out, they, they came from us, presuming to speak from us or on behalf of us. And, and we want you to know, we gave them no such commandment. They were doing this of their own accord, not with our support or backing. And we we did not support that in any way. And again, the, the implication is this, that as a true believer from the Gentiles, what a joy it is to know that we don't have to be circumcised or keep the law. Now, of course, we know it doesn't mean that we can be lawless. Uh, I just reading uh, this morning, Romans 7. You know, we're in Lord to Christ now, right? Where our connection is with the risen man. We're not connected with the law anymore. We, we have the spirit of God living within us, uh, the Lord Jesus living his life through us as manifested by the spirit. 
And is he going to live a lawless life? The spirit of God, as he takes control of our lives, not one bit. And so quite clearly, uh, we're not under law. We gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. I love that. See, Barnabas and Paul have been ones who have been preaching this message of the gospel of grace of, of God, uh, that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing. And he says, we want you to know that these are beloved Barnabas and Paul. We're in full accord with these men. We appreciate them. In fact, so much so, these we, we would tell you that we appreciate these men, these men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hold these men in the highest regard. By the way, it's good to hold people in high regard, isn't it? And, and we thank God for, for people that have been influential in our lives, that have shared Christ with us, that have, have, have modeled the Christian life for us. We appreciate them and value them. I was amongst the Lumbee Indians of North Carolina, and they were, they were telling me about one of their uh, now departed brothers called Venus Brooks. And they were talking about how this guy... Even in the Second World War, he's on a tank and he would be standing uh, to all his other tank commanders, even though there'd be bullets flying around, preaching the gospel to them. He said, these are the caliber of men that influenced us in days gone by. And we esteem these men. We thank God for them. And said, Barnabas and Saul, these are men that have hazarded their lives for the Lord Jesus. Oh, how grateful we are for such men. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you, the same things by mouth. Remember this, this two witnesses, three witnesses telling the same thing. So they've got it by letter and it's also being given verbally. So there's just, you, you couldn't have clearer communication. And then he says, verse 28, by the way, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. In other words, even the decisions we've made, we understand that the Holy Spirit has has certainly guided in this, and it's really, uh, he's the one that is directing these things, and so if it seemed good to us, uh, to, to the Holy Ghost, who are we to disagree, and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, and then they go through these four things that they would be good to do, and he says, uh, if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, so in other words, this is a good way to act. You're going to do well. It's not saying it's anything to do with your salvation, but you'll do well. It's good to be thinking about not being a stumbling block to others, and especially the Jewish community who we want to reach with the gospel. Now, again, for many of us, that's not an issue anymore. Right? We don't have much interaction with the synagogue. If there is one in Springfield, I'm not sure even if there is. There probably is. But, uh, but I've never been there. I've never met anybody from there. And, and so I'm not too worried not that i have a chance to buy meat off of the idols but but these things are not really an issue but he goes on and he says <clears throat> so when they were dismissed they came to antioch and when they had gathered the multitude together they delivered the epistle which when they had read they rejoiced for the consolation so a, a tremendous thing has happened here a potential rift of the church into a Jewish party and a Gentile party has been averted. Still now one body. And we've got to be careful of anything that would, would cause us to divide the body, the oneness of the body. And, and even Jewish ministries, uh, I get very nervous when they deny Ephesian truth. Jew and Gentile in one body. I just think that's so critical. In the church now, there's no distinction. We're one in Christ. The Jew has no advantage over the Gentile in the church today. And my wife and I have fond memories of a, a man that uh, we were neighbors. Uh, it, we, it was a, a home up in Northern Ireland that we could stay in just to get a refreshment and break. And there was a brother who lived next door. He was a, a, a Jewish man. Uh, believer and he was in the local assembly and uh, we just loved the fact that just even to hear this man pray and worship was a delight but he he didn't see himself as any different to any of us he, he was just a delightful brother in the lord 
and we have, we have such fun memories of him. He was, he was he just loved the Lord. It was wonderful. And that's the way it's meant to be in one body. And so he says that um, Judas and, and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exalted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. So now they're they're just they're going along to these Gentile churches, and two of these chief men among the brethren who happen to be prophets are having a ministry of confirmation, confirming them in the truth. I mean that's wonderful, a confirming ministry that that gives you assurance and makes things really solid in your mind. That was their, their kind of ministry, confirmed the saints in a beautiful way. And so uh, Judas and Silas did that after they had tarried their pace, they were let go in peace from the brethren to the apostles. In other words, they they'd done what they were sent to do, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still. And we're glad Silas did. In fact, Silas is going to be a pretty big player for the rest of uh, the book of Acts and even going to be the penman for Peter. Uh, his um, first epistle, epistle was penned by Silas, Silvanus, it says, but it's the same guy. Uh, just the Roman pronunciation rather than the Jewish. And so th this guy is going to be a pretty important individual from now on. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So again, you've got this idea there's a plural gifted ministry, uh, all preaching in the church in Antioch, building up the church and all the rest of it. And so tremendous uh, aversion of, of division. And again, putting people under the law. And I just say this again, uh, I mentioned it last time, but Peter, when he was uh, testifying uh, at this, uh, this council or whatever, this discussion that was going on, uh, he had mentioned that uh, the, the law had put a burden on them that they themselves were not able to bear. Look at 15 verse 10. Now, therefore, why tempt you, God, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And the point is this. The yoke of the law is a very heavy yoke. And he said, how did we get on? Like, how did... How did our fathers get on? How are we getting on under this yoke of bondage? Well, not very well, because it's impossible to keep it. And so what's the alternative? Well, in the words of our Lord Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, and I mentioned it last time, but I'm going to mention it again because I think it's so critical in this context. Matthew 11, verse 28. Not law, but Christ. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What a tremendous difference between a heavy yoke that we couldn't bear and a yoke that's easy. But to take Christ's yoke, you've got to bow right to get under the yoke and the jews were stiff-necked they didn't want to bow but it's good to bow and to get under that yoke and so it's good just to be reminded that salvation it's a simple matter of faith in the finished work of the lord jesus nothing added faith alone in christ alone plus nothing now we come to this Final little section, verse 36 through 41, the division over John Mark. I wonder, have you ever been really disappointed in someone? Someone you really respected and held in high esteem. And then something occurred and you kind of left a bit devastated. Because they failed. Passage that was read um, this morning by Brother Andy from Isaiah um, 42. He stopped in verse 3. But verse 4 says, concerning the Lord Jesus, he shall not fail, neither be discouraged. But everybody else, will we ever fail? Oh, yes. Have we ever failed? Yes. <laughs> will we fail again? Yes, unless the rapture occurs before this message is over, we will fail again. 
And so we just keep having to remind ourselves that the reason people disappoint us is because we have placed unrealistic expectations upon them. We're expecting people never to let us down, never to disappoint us. We've put them on a pedestal. We've, we've somehow elevated these individuals. And the bigger we elevate somebody, the more we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. And we say it again, the best of men are men at best. We heard this morning about the heart, right? And the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Guard your heart. Out of it are the issues of life. So why do I say all this? Because our heroes, Paul and Barnabas, are about to disappoint us. These men have been through so much together. They've endured persecution together. They stood together as one in doctrinal controversy over what the gospel is. We, we've witnessed the Lord use them both mightily in, in the gospel and in edifying the saints. However, we have to learn a very important lesson that these men weren't perfect men yet. They are actually now. Barnabas and Saul are absolutely perfect right now. But they weren't at this point. They already, in a sense, had stated, and so we should really take them for uh, their, their word for, uh, seriously. In chapter 14, verse 15, it says, saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We are also men of like passions with you and preach unto the uh, uh, preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities to the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them. Notice that phrase. We are men of like passions as you we're all made out of the same cookie dough every one of us all of the same passions even the old testament elijah right again uh, do we tend to elevate people like elijah well he says uh, uh, james says he's a man of like passions just like we are and so we've got to recognize this that these men are just men there, and men are destined to fail. And so verse 36, it says, and, and, and some days after Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. I want to suggest to you that perhaps behind this is pastoral concern about these new converts from the first missionary journey. And maybe some of it is because of what's just gone on, you know, did the Judaizers just come to Antioch? Or did they go to some of the other places where the gospel has come among the Gentiles? And so there's a concern. How are they doing, these new converts? And and so we see something of the heart of the Apostle Paul here. Uh, we see that he's not just an evangelist and a teacher, but he's also a shepherd. It concerns him how the saints are doing. By the way, that's the work of a shepherd, isn't it? The well-being of the sheep is very important to him. How are they doing? He's concerned about them. He, he wants to know how they're doing, wants to, uh, to find out. And of course, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing when you find out that they're doing well. <laughs> it's a joy to find that out. But there's this idea of caring for the well-being of the saints. And so it meant, uh, um, this was no easy task, it meant going back to cities where they had met with hostility, even stoning. So there's a cost involved in checking up on the sheep. Because they had, remember, we, we went through these journeys together. They'd actually been stoned in one place and left for dead. And you say, well, you want to go back there? <laughs> I can think of a lot of nice places that I'd like to go, but I'm not sure I want to go there. But the saints aren't in those other nice places, but they are in these difficult places. And so we've got to go to them. And so we see something of his heart here. And so it says, verse 37, Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, we, we've already seen he's been a 
involved in this. In fact, he was one that had abandoned the missionary team. When the going got tough, he went home to Mama. And so, <clears throat> although Barnabas and Saul were agreed on the need for the journey, they weren't agreed on the composition of the team who would go. They recognized there was a need for the shepherding ministry, but the composition of the team, that was not uh, something that they could agree on. And so now the trouble begins to erupt. And if you notice, it says, verse 38, Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them. And they departed asunder, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed onto Cyprus. Barnabas is determined to take John Mark. And Saul is equally, or Paul is equally determined not to take John Mark. And they're both insistent. And that's when we have problems, isn't it? When you get two people and they're both insisting on their way. And their ways are not agreed. And so what happened is, well, they had a big bust up. And it was strong, sharp contention. Probably raised voices. Maybe even unkind words. But it was not what we're used to seeing from our heroes. It was an outburst. It's not even over doctrine. They're not arguing, but they're agreed on doctrine. It's over practice. It's over how the work should be done. And it raises some important questions. You see, here's the real questions. What is more important, the work or the worker? If you had asked Paul, he'd say, well, it's the work. If you'd asked Barnabas, he'd say, no, it's the worker. Right? So, so you might say this, Paul is task oriented. There's some people like that, right? They're task. It's all about the job. We've got to get the job done. It doesn't matter what happens to people's feelings along, as long as we get the job done. The task is everything. On the other hand, Barnabas, he's people oriented. Poor old John Mark. He's failed. I want to see him back in the ministry. I want to, I want to help him. And so both parties have a strong case because the work is important and the worker is important. And so they both have this strong case and neither one is willing to yield. And something happens. There's a division between. Now, let me just mention something that we've got to throw into the mixture here. And that is the doctrine of divine providence. What I mean by that is that God is able to use men's wrong decisions, foolish decisions, to accomplish his purposes. So, so the end result of this, actually, is that even though they didn't act in a good way, by, by the way, the story is not finished yet. But what's interesting is that the missionary effort from the church at Antioch doubled. Two teams go out. Barnabas and John Mark, and then Paul and Silas. And it's interesting that Barnabas and John Mark go to where they began their missionary journey, Cyprus. Paul and Silas go to where it ended. And so they were covering the ground that was necessary, but they went their different ways. And so again, as I think of providence, sometimes God overrules even man's stubbornness and unwillingness to yield and he still overrules it for his own glory. That's a remarkable thing. I think of the story of Joseph. When I think of providence of God, I think of the story of Joseph. Everything about it was providential. And he said to his brothers at the end, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. And isn't, it, isn't it encouraging to know that even though we're all just men and we all make wrong decisions, God is still able to use it for his glory. 
I did start late, so I'm just just in case anybody's thinking about the clock here. And so again, we just need to understand the providence of God. As a result of this sharp contention, Barnabas takes John Mark and sails to Cyprus. And it's obvious that he he does a great work in the life of John Mark. His concern for the worker is going to pay great dividends that even Paul will have to acknowledge in the end. On the other hand, um, Paul chose Silas and departed, and God mightily used them in the spread of the gospel, as we're going to see further on as we progress in this marvelous book. And so they, it says, Paul chose Silas, verse 40, and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. It's interesting. It didn't say that about John Mark and Barnabas. Whether they weren't commended, we, we don't really know. We don't want to read into it. But we do know that Paul and Silas were commended by the brethren. And they went out. And they went through Syria and Cilicia and confirmed the churches. And so just to, as we kind of wrap up, just a practical lesson. Um, in terms of the story of John Mark, I, I know you know all this, but it's just good to remind ourselves that, that later on, Paul acknowledged that Barnabas, well, that he was wrong about John Mark, that John Mark turned out all right. Which is a great lesson for all of us, isn't it? Because what it tells us is this. Even though men fail, failure doesn't have to be fine. Are you glad? I mean, we'd have all given up a long time ago if failure had been final. Because we've all failed. <laughs> Some of us frequently fail. And, and uh, the Lord has not said to us yet, I'm done with you. I'm setting you on the scrap heap. No, no, he keeps working with us. And that's exactly what was going on here. Colossians 4, verse 10, just a couple of verses, just as we bring this to a close. He says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments, if he comes unto you, receive him. So Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, receive him. Uh, and then in Philemon, you get this lovely reference here, Philemon 1 verse 24, it says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. That's good, isn't it? Paul could admit now, actually, John Mark, he's my fellow laborer. And then one more, and uh, this is uh, a delightful one. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Second Timothy 4, verse 11. It says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And then I keep saying one more thing, but then there's one more thing. <laughs> That's the problem with the word of God. There's always one more thing. It's just so full. But let me just say this, and it's a lovely thought. The person who God chose to write the gospel of the servant who will not fail Mark's gospel was the servant who failed, John Mark. And I'm sure that when John Mark wrote about the servant who will not fail, he was so thankful as somebody who had failed that his Savior will never fail. And aren't we glad this morning that we may fail, but the Lord Jesus he shall not fail, neither be discouraged. So glad of that. And again, pray for leaders, right? Our leaders, that they would be men who would be given help to make scriptural decisions. And then will be given help to communicate those decisions so there's no question marks in any of our minds. And if they fail you or disappoint you at some point, just remind yourself, they're not perfect yet, but they will be. One day they will be, and so will we. What a day that will be. Let's pray. Father, we're, we're just humbled by your word that you take 
failing, faltering men and still are able to use them to magnify your son, the Lord Jesus. Father, we're here this morning because we are so thankful that he shall not fail. Everything that he set about to do, including building this church, he's not going to fail. And he's not discouraged. Sometimes we get discouraged, but he's not discouraged. And so we thank thee for the Lord Jesus this morning. Father, we're thankful that we're not under the yoke of bondage this morning either. But we would be mindful that we don't cause others to stumble by flaunting our liberty, maybe in an unwarranted way. Help us to be mindful of others. We don't want them to be hindered from coming to the Savior. So, Lord, we lift these things to thee. We're thankful that you can use your word in ways beyond what we could ever understand or imagine. And we ask that you might use this message this morning for the glory of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Justin, can I get you to...